This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you for joining us. Today we have Richard Fields with me and our guest, the treasurer from Solano County, Solano County Libertarian Party. That's a mouthful, Robert DiMadura. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Gentlemen, this week Trump gets coronavirus and the world kind of lost its collective mind. It's, uh, man, the social aspects where you've got people pointing out hypocrisy on both the left and the right, it's like a spinning wheel of hypocrisy and the media doesn't know what to do with itself, and the, the politics. Lord knows how the politics is going to play out. Um, hey, Robert, what do you think about the social aspects of this? What happened in your social timeline? Did it kind of explode with the massive hypocrisy that mine did? It, it absolutely did, yeah. The, the people that were screaming, you know, um, denounce hate, denounce hate, were, were saying, I hope he dies, and that's terrible. And, um, and, and, and I mean, even on both sides, you know, like, uh, the hypocrisy with with him saying, you know, Biden need, was wearing the biggest mask ever, and then him getting uh, the the Rona a couple of days later. There was a there was a lot of hypocrisy. It definitely blew up. A lot to talk about for sure. Did you see that? What was your kind of timeline? You're on mostly politics there, Richard. I suppose the the politics of this. Yeah, you know, I've been up in the I've been I've been up in the mountains for the last uh, three days, so I've been able to. I, you know, I listened to a little bit on, on satellite radio tuned in CNN and it was just, you know, you know while Trump was taking his joyride uh, out of Walter Reed and waving to the, you know, to the followers and CNN could talk about nothing but the fact that he uh, had a cloth mask and the Secret Service people had uh, medical grade masks and they thought that was a scandal. Anyway, uh, you know, the, the whole, the whole thing, I, the way I look at it is this way, the government, particularly the federal government should not be involved in medicine one way or another. It shouldn't be involved in science one way or another. We have scientists that can give us good scientific opinion. Scientists don't always agree with the, uh, each other. And this is a very good case in point. You, you know, ask a, you know, ask scientist A and you'll get one opinion. Ask scientist B, you'll get another. Ask epidemiologist A, you'll get one. And an epide epidemiologist B, get another. It's just like asking one libertarian or another libertarian <laughs> opinion there. You're going to get different different answers. We need to trust the people of the United States to make up their own mind who to listen to, how to consult with their own doctors, and to figure out what the best course of action is, whether to wear a mask or not, whether to social distance or not, whether to uh, stay home uh, or not, whether to go to work or not. Uh, for me, I'm uh, past the age of 70. Uh, I've had a, I've got a, you know, a, a childhood history of lung diseases, pneumonia, that sort of thing. I choose to wear masks and social distance when I'm in public. When I'm not, I don't worry about it. When I'm walking around an open field, I don't wear a silly mask. But if I'm walking through a, a busy downtown intersection, I do. Uh, I can make my own decisions, so can other people. Yeah. For me, the most disturbing thing was really we've lost kind of this social connection. It seems like we're just so ready to get at each other's throat over literally anything. Somebody gets the coronavirus, which happens to millions of people. And, you know, all of a sudden now it's, oh, it's death on the president or how dare you or all kinds of various. And no one says, hey, you know, people get sick every day. It's a, it's a tragedy. We hope they get better. And, you know, maybe we've been too mean to each other the last for eight, 12, 20 years, however it's long as this cycle of hypocrisy has been spinning. I think we've just kind of reached peak hypocrisy where now everybody's just pointing fingers at each other. So you're a bad person, you're a bad person, and whatever I believe is right, whatever you believe is wrong, and that's kind of the end of the discussion. Well, yeah, and the fact that government's involved in medicine and science means that it gets, by definition, politicized. And the last thing we need to do is politicize health, if that's what we're talking about people making their own health care decisions. And it, you should not have to listen to a politician give you advice, which he has no business making, no qualifications to make about how you take care of yourself health, health wise. Yeah, Robert, you got anything on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I follow, uh, I'm, I'm right there with Richard. Um, government in it being in medicine and science and saying you know doing mandates and, and things like that is, has never really led to uh anything um you know prosperous or or you know there was always an, a better way government seems to find 
every way to screw things up. And uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at on that. Yeah, well, talking about kind of screwing it up, the media is starting to change its tune with Sweden and the coronavirus. If you guys have noticed the coverage, I know Richard's been gone the last three days, and this, so this might be kind of new. In just the last few days, we've had a, what, a CNBC video, five-minute video about how Corona, how Sweden's been dealing with coronavirus, how it's now viewed as successful rather than a scourge on, on the world. And, and, and then just today, or was it yesterday, the New York Times, I guess it was yesterday, the New York Times printed a similar article showing about, hey, you know, maybe we can learn something from how Sweden has a, the approach, the Swedish approach. And well, the Swedish approach is essentially a libertarian approach. It's use your head, use common sense, take care of yourself. If you're if you have comorbidities, you know, uh, take care of yourself, uh, isolate whatever you need to do. If you don't, if you have uh, if you're 25 and healthy and have two or three or four kids to feed, by all means, go to work. Uh, and, you know, the government should have no uh, business telling people who is essential and who is not essential. That's just that's just uh, uh, hubris on the part of the politicians. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in, in Sweden, um, you know, they, they, they've they admitted some mistakes that they've had early on, you know, with, you know, caring for their vulnerable. And um, they, they're doing a lot better now. And uh, they, they are actually, you know, they, they never closed down the schools and and um, they they took the, the libertarian approach, as you said. And um, I would love to see us into more, you know, response to our uh to our coronavirus um you know uh dealing with the coronavirus i think that that was definitely the best way i personally was advocating you know for hey uh guys we have to consider if we shut down the economy we're looking at 30 plus million people losing their jobs or losing their businesses or not being able to provide for their families so if you were young like you know like you mentioned too uh, if you were young and your family, you didn't have the option to do that, and uh, that definitely was not the right right route. I think Sweden um, was was the best, uh, you know, the way Sweden did it was the best way to go, and we can see it now. We can see the effects. They don't have the depression levels. They don't have the devastated economy. They don't. Um, their kids are in school learning, and and you know, you know uh, uh, just you know doing their thing. Everybody there is, is doing great. And, uh, better than yeah. what else I've heard. Yeah. They didn't have the cultural the other, the other consideration is that we, for better or worse, and probably for worse right now, the United States is, le- is thought of as a, as a thought leader in the area of science. Uh, and, uh, so we have who, what, what we adopt as policy tends to be followed by other countries around the world to disastrous effects in, in Asia and Africa where, uh, kids are being sold into marriage. Basically, uh, parents are selling their daughters for a, for a dowry to not have to take care of them anymore because they're not working. Uh, and that's the only economic choice that they have. That's just one of the many, many uh, dire effects that we're seeing uh, by other countries following the lead of the United States in shutting economies down. That's actually been the most tragic um, impact of the coronavirus lockdowns and the discussions we don't have. It's not even the coronavirus deaths, it's the suicides, it's the economic devastation, it's the social dis- it's the social disintegration and the cultural destruction. It you know it all kind of falls one from out the other and it's bad enough that people are dying from coronavirus, but the fact that so much devastation has happened because of the reaction to it when we now have data that says okay, maybe we overreacted. And maybe it's time for us to kind of rethink our, at least our mindset, if not necessarily the policies as we try to unwind what we've done. Yeah, yeah, definitely adding insult to injury uh, was was something I was hoping, I was just praying for, just not to add insult to injury. But, you know, I I think we've made leaps and bounds for sure. Well, you're sitting there suffering from this injury, right? You're a businessman who had your business closed because of coronavirus, if if memory strikes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I own a salon here, a family owned salon, me and my mother uh, here in Vacaville. And uh, we were, you know, we had to be shut down. And they at one point they said, you guys can do hair, but you have to do it outside. And that didn't make any sense. I mean, a lot of these girls, the, the bread and butter, the way they make their money is through hair color. And, um, you, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to 
put the girl, you know, I don't know, hose them down. Well, hose, you know, I don't know, man. But, Sometimes it wasn't work, right? Yeah. Right, right. So then that's what I mean. When the government gets involved and brings their solutions, I mean, that that I don't know of anyone that actually did that. They were not doing regular the regular clients outside, um, you know, in order to, to stay in business. So I don't know. Well, that's what happens when politics enters into the into the business world, right? It all just kind of messes it up because businesses and business owners know how to get the job done, know how to keep their employees and their and their customers safe. No one wants to kill their employees or their customers. That's dumb. And, <laughs> and so it just is. And so politicians saying, well, you can do it this way or do it that way kind of leads to all kinds of problems. And speaking of government leading to problems, social media meddling. The, uh, Facebook has changed their terms of service on October, and I like to remind everybody, October 1st, and I like to remind everybody that they did so to comply with the law. The ancient state in their own statement that they were making these changes to stay in compliance with the law. But that compliance has now led to the mass deletion of libertarian groups. I know some libertarian uh, campaign people had got their accounts deleted. And I, we've had, what is it? There was a presidential candidate for the American Party. No. Oh, I forget. One of the small, one of the smaller parties. He's in like three states, but he had his Facebook account deleted. And so, when we talk about election interference and election meddling, how much of this is Facebook guilty of? Lots. Uh, the social media uh, director for uh, Spike Cohen, the uh, Libertarian vice presidential candidate. Uh, my understanding is that uh, she got knocked off uh, of Facebook. It's uh, a very, very clear situation that. Facebook is under the implicit threat of being prosecuted as a monopoly or worse if they don't uh, knuckle under to the uh, wishes of various regulatory agencies and I should add intelligence agencies. This this uh, this uh, goes very very you know I mean the conspiracy theories go very deep and I'm not in a position to say any of them are right or wrong but they're is a huge problem when the third largest party in the country gets knocked off of the uh, primary or the, 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 the biggest social media site with no explanation and no no given reason other than our policy change. We're not going to tell you what that policy change is. Yeah. No, go yeah. ahead. You know, um, I, I know a bunch of people personally that uh, have been, you know, taken off, off of social media. And I know some people even um that aren't really big on politics but are you know more religious i should say and and that that you know brings raises questions for me as well um i i think that facebook is playing a huge role in in affecting the way people's minds are and the way they're thinking about the election and and not just uh, presidential election but also local elections as well you know it's it's kind of I think people now, it seems, are paying more attention to their local uh, representatives and people running more than ever um, because they they see how much power they, you know, through the through uh, the, the COVID crisis, um, how much power they actually have. They can they can vote their city council or their or their uh, you know county supervisors or you know they can vote to open up their their uh, cities if they wanted to. So I think that people are paying a lot more attention now, and Facebook is definitely. Um, having an effect on all of that. Well, I know one of their policy changes has been that you can, can't can run new political ads in the last week before an election, which means as, as me as a candidate, I have to set my, my political ads to run eight, nine days before the end of the election, which means I can't change my ads in the last week of an election if circumstances change, if some news event happens and I want to put out a new ad on a news event, I can't. I have to essentially schedule my ads before it comes out. So the last week, you don't get to, you have to make your decision on your marketing for that last week, 10 days out. You can't make so it. Eight, so eight, eight days out, somebody could accuse you of being, uh, you know, uh, uh, a horrible person and you would not be able to respond. Correct. Yeah. I didn't know about that. That's, that's, uh, that's crazy in itself too. Yeah. News changes every day almost now, you know, Trump didn't have the run three days ago. So yeah, Trump, <laughs> or the news changes. And I think, yeah, and I think he went home. I just for, for disclosure, I think he went home as we were recording this today. I think he went back to the White House, if if memory serves. As, you know, so that's a good sign for everybody. But 
yeah, this inter interference in the elections, we've uh, lost a lot of libertarian groups that had tens of thousands of people. Now, some of them were kind of unruly, but, you know, they weren't they weren't infecting like the rest of Facebook. They were unruly for the people in the group. I don't understand. <laughs> you know, it was like an optional group. It's not like it hit everybody's Facebook page. I don't understand why you would take a, away a group with just a bunch of people arguing with each other. I, some of this stuff doesn't make any sense. So, well, speaking about not making any sense and speaking about us all bagging on Facebook and how they're handling this, um, the government is talking about, as Richard brought up, talking about breaking up Facebook, specifically WhatsApp and um, Instagram. They want to force Facebook to sell off Instagram or, and WhatsApp for some reason. I'm still not quite sure why. It's just well, it's interesting. I mean, the whole idea of a monopoly is that uh, a monopoly will uh, have a 100% one, of the business in an industry and price itself so low that nobody else can compete. Once they've squeezed out all of their competitors, they'll raise their prices to monopolistic levels, which of course uh, are, are higher than the market would bear if they did have competition. But the problem is Facebook doesn't charge their customers. Uh, you know, the, the, the people that use Facebook, it's a free service. Now, the, the, the downside of that for the people that use Facebook is that if you're getting it for free, you are the product. And uh, <laughs> you're not the customer. <laughs> yeah, you're, the, you're, you're the product. Uh, but I mean, there is there, there can't be a monopoly by definition when you're giving the giving away the service for free. So there is no precedent whatsoever in monopoly legislation or monopoly law or monopoly uh, uh, judicial rulings or anything else for the government to do be doing anything. And I'm sure I'm sure they'll make something up because both Democrats and Republicans want to make sure that they control the narrative on Facebook. And uh, Zuckerberg is going to do everything he can to make sure th that he uh, kowtows to both of their uh, narratives meaning that he's going to freeze out anything other than the duopoly Republicans and Democrats when it comes to political discourse. And that's a growth violation of the First Amendment, not to mention free speech in general. Well, are they going to maybe argue that it's a advertisement monopoly, that it's not really the average person like you and me that they're acting as a monopoly on? It's, it's the advertisers, it's the businesses that they're actually being a monopoly. So it's not us that they're actually protecting, it's businesses that they're trying to protect. Yeah, but that doesn't wash. I mean, I, I spent my whole life uh, up until 10, about 15 years ago in the advertising business. There's still a number of radio stations around. There's still a few print media outlets around, believe it or not. There's still, uh, you know, multiple platforms other than Facebook. I mean, uh, you know, if you don't like Facebook, I guess I, I think I think Faith, uh, uh, MySpace is still around. I'm not really sure. Uh, but, the, the, you know, there are other outlets for uh, businesses to advertise on, Craigslist, whatever. You don't have to be advertising on, they don't have a monopoly on advertising either. Yeah, yeah. It's, I wonder if that's where they were going to go is because there, there doesn't make any sense. None of this actually makes any sense other than they don't like the fact that Facebook has a direct contact with people. People can directly contact. Democrats and Republicans don't like the possibility, the even remote possibility that a third party, particularly the Libertarian Party, is going to draw from their vassals. Yeah, they don't like us being in their party, do they there, Robert? Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> they they definitely have a stronghold on that. And and uh, I, I, I do, I think they see it coming. I think they see the growth of the Libertarian Party and how it's- well, yeah, they, they, yeah, they see it coming. They see that well over a majority of the people are either independent or uh, uh, specifically libertarian or another third party, mostly libertarian. And most independents are libertarian sympathizers in, 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 in most respects. In fact, probably most Democrats, or not most, but a, a, a large plurality of Democrats and Republicans are libertarian in their philosophical sense. So, you know, we're a real threat and they're trying to stem up at the at the outset. That's why Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen were excluded from the debates, as have been their predecessors, Gary Johnson uh, and and other libertarian ca presidential candidates going way back. Uh, well, since the beginning, actually, uh, they don't want competition. And the the monopoly, the uh, duopoly, which is a monopoly of two, that's been going on uh, ever since uh, the Civil War between Republicans and Democrats. 
right? right. Yeah. Well, if, do either one of you guys actually on a bridge? Because there was a, a nose <laughs> that, 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 that crossed my schedule here. Um, Russians have committed to not interfering with the United States elections. Now, anybody who buys this, we need to sell a bridge because <laughs> <laughs> they have been interfering with our elections since they existed. As anybody to well, think that's that, sort of like would you sell, would you buy the bridge to somebody who says that the United States is not going to interfere in the election in say Ukraine or any number of other third world countries where we've been interfering for millennia? It's it's what governments do. It's what the CIA does. It's what the KGB or its successor agencies have done. That's what foreign governments do. Sometimes they're better at it. Sometimes they're more obvious. Sometimes less obvious. But all all governments try to uh, influence the outcome of elections in other countries to their own benefit. Nothing new. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just in agreement. <laughs> they, that's just what they do. Yeah. Um, whether whether they are successful or yeah, doing it, um, you know, more out in the open or not, like you said, it's uh, it, it's definitely going to happen no matter what. If there's if there's some kind of interest there at all, it's going to happen. And that's something that I think you know most people should understand. You know. Oh, you know, Russia, you know, collusion and all this and that. And I mean, collusion definitely would be a big deal, but everyone is involved in our elections and trying to sway it, you know, uh, other nations. Uh, it's just a normal thing. Yeah. And, 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 wouldn't, and, and it wouldn't be such a big deal, except that we have troops in 150 or some uh, odd countries. And what we do in other countries is of huge importance to Russia, China, any number of other countries, Middle Eastern countries. So the best way to avoid the Russians or anybody else <clears throat> getting involved in U.S. elections is to quit meddling in, in, in other countries. Well, we sure, certainly don't have the right to talk like some moral authority. Oh, you! how dare you interfere with our elections when we're running around interfering in everybody's elections? It's like a car thief complaining his car got stolen. I'm sorry, you don't get to have the moral authority to complain that much about it. You can mention and, it. And, and the solution is not government, uh, you know, it's not finger pointing or legislation or anything that the uh, politicians are trying to do. The solution is transparency. If we find out that the Russians are meddling, point a, point a spotlight at it. That means that they're meddling immediately. Uh, the, the value of their meddling immediately goes to, to near zero. Absolutely. Well, I call that regulation through education. Yeah, I also want to point out we are an immigrant country. And so, you know, I used to work with a crew of, of mostly Russian and Ukrainian immigrants. And now, while they both had different political views, you know, is it such a surprise that they might want to hear what people in Russia or people in Ukraine think about American issues? And so, if they're actually if you know, Ukraine and Russia are giving their opinions, you know, is that really anything against what America is about? You know, are we really so afraid of the Russian opinion that we can't hear it? I'm not. I'm perfectly willing to have, you know, Russia try to influence our elections because, quite frankly, I think we're stronger than that. And so it doesn't scare me that other countries try. I think the balances itself out in the long run and we'll all be fine. I have more faith in our system and in our people than that we're just going to be quietly pushed over by, you know, Russian meme farms. I just don't think it's going to do much good. <laughs> so we got a few minutes left. China's women in the global tech war. That is kind of the last thing on our list. We've got, uh, there was a report out that says China is taking the lead in a large number of tech industries. Now, I'm not entirely sure I believe it, but what do you guys think? I believe it. I, I, I know that uh, the uh, complaint, uh, particularly from Democrats and from Trump, is that uh, the uh, Chinese have been stealing our technology right and left and, and so forth. And I'm sure that's gone on. Uh, and I'm sure that in, in many cases, it's American technology companies willingly giving technology to China in exchange for access to their markets. That's not stealing. That's a trade deal. You know, that's that's making a, a, a knowing uh, decision, knowing that you have have access to a market of billions in exchange for giving them some of our technology. I'm not sure that's the most intelligent thing for American tech companies to do, but that's that has happened. And they have, uh, I'm sure, uh, put people in high places in American universities and so forth to uh, transmit inf information back on the on the dial low. But as far as whether Chinese are getting ahead of us, yeah, I think so. 
It's sort of like uh, back in the post World War II days when Japan was uh, selling when when Made in Japan was uh, was a uh, a symbol for shoddy goods. Well, that turned around very gradually as Japan learned from us and began to build upon our technology and eventually to surpass our technologies. So the we got to a point where to where Toyotas. Uh, were you know were and probably still are a much better product than Chevrolets or, or Fords. Uh, the same thing is happening with uh, with technology, with uh, internet technology, with the hardware and with the software. We've got companies like Tencent and others that are uh, making uh, Amazon look like a, a bit player in terms of size. Okay, Robert. Yeah, um, as far as yet, yeah, uh, China surpassing our technology uh, and, and becoming the leaders are becoming leaders in a, a lot of other ways, too. Um, and, and I, you know, we could see this coming for sure. You know, everything is made from China. I would imagine that um, they would be investing a lot of that into technology. And I think from what I understand, yeah, their cell phone technology is a next level above ours. Uh, I was actually... Uh, I was actually uh, really excited uh, that that phone that flipped open and it had a bigger screen and it was kind of seamless here. And Huawei was the first one to come out with that. I just saw one that Samsung came out with as well, but last year, and um, they were the first ones to do it. It does seem that they are ahead of us, uh, definitely in the cell phone technology area. Yeah, well, I know once you start learning how to do something, then you can start refining it and making that process better. It's just the question, I guess the long-term question is, can they innovate? Can that system create the innovations or can they, are the copying improvements? I guess that's where- Well, and the answer is yes, uh, to a, quite a great extent. Uh, the Chinese have moved away from the uh, communist one, uh, the, state, the state owns everything model. They've privatized uh, a lot of their, uh, particularly their, their tech industries. Now, that's not to say they don't have a, a thumb on the scale when it comes to the Chinese Communist Party. They do, but they've given a lot of leeway to uh, companies to innovate and to uh, succeed financially. And once you have this, the, the ability to make money and to succeed financially from your innovation uh, and uh, you know profit from the innovation that you make, uh, Chinese are smart people, uh, and, you know, and, and they, you know, just look at the... Uh, the, the test scores in uh, California universities, the Chinese, the uh, Asians routinely have higher test scores than uh, native, you know, than white Americans do. And that is uh, all they're, they're smart people. people. And that's all the time we've got, Richard. Thank you guys for joining us. You can catch all us all updates at libertariancounterpoint.com. And thank you for joining us. And please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.